afternoon, Jay. Your meeting is now live. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Employment Committee. Uh, I'm getting quite a bit of feedback from someone, so if everyone could just mute themselves, that would be great. Um, and we can get going. Um, Oh, sorry, I froze again. Okay, everyone. Apologies, I'm clearly having technology issues, but uh, we'll we'll sh go ahead without the agenda. I'm sure I'll figure it out. Uh, people can remind me if I've forgotten something. So, welcome to the, today's employment committee. Um, we'll do a quick uh, round robin just to check who is here. I'll start with myself. Uh, my name is Ben Dowling. I'm one of the Lib Dem councillors for Milton Ward and the chair of today's committee. Uh, Leader, could you go next? Hello, I'm Geraldine Jackson. I'm leader of the council and I'm a member of this committee. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sanders? Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm Darren Sanders. I'm one of the Liberal Democrat councillors for Baffins Ward. Thank you, Councillor Stubbs. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm Luke Stubbs. I'm a Conservative councillor in Eastern Craneswater, and I'm deputising today for Councillor Donna Jones, who has a diary conflict. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, councillor Corkery. Afternoon, all. Cal Corkery, councillor for Charles Dickens Ward and member of the Labour Group. Thank you, Cal. Uh, we'll now just uh, do a quick roll call to see which uh, council officers are joining us today. Uh, we'll start with the Chief Executive. Good afternoon, everybody. David Williams, Chief Executive. Uh, we'll, and just in the order on the uh, teams list, I've got Peter Bolf next. Uh, Peter Bolf, City Solicitor. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Rochelle. Rochelle Nella, Human Resources. Natasha. Natasha Edmonds, Director of Corporate Services. Sue. Sue Page from Finance. Uh, Vicky. Vicky Fleetest, Democratic Services. Uh, Peter. Again, supporting the webcast. Sean. Hi, everyone. Sean Tetley, Power and Pension Manager. Thank you. And Liz. Hello, Liz Walder, Procurement. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm supposed to read something out that says we're doing things according to some some sort of uh, a government act, but I can't find uh, the email because I've been locked out. So, um, Vicky, do I absolutely have to get it exactly right, or can I say that there's a government act and uh, we're using the model standing orders as published in that act due to COVID, like the same as every other council meeting and if somebody really wants to look it up they can watch a different meeting of somebody getting it right that will do wonderful thank you peter um are, do we have any apologies for today's meeting other than councillor jones i haven't received any other apologies chair but i didn't hear you call out matthew atkins councillor atkins oh apologies i he's not on my list is he councillor atkins are you here He doesn't. He's not showing us in the meeting, Vicky. No, okay, he is well, not with us. No, I'll put a question because he he is in. He is a member of employment committee. Anyway, that's fine. Okay, wonderful. I was only calling people that are here, um, but yes, apologies. So we don't have apologies, but uh, he may be having issues and will potentially join us soon. Uh, okay, thank you very much, everyone. I believe the first item on the agenda is um, decorations of interest. Does anybody have any? Silence. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item is um, well. First of all, we've said we will vary the order in order to take the living wage report uh, towards the front of the agenda. But I would like to just approve the minutes first, if that's okay with everyone. So we'll take the minutes. Um, it, can anyone? Um, is anyone happy to propose the minutes? I'm happy to propose the minutes. Thank you, leader. Anyone would like to second the minutes? 
I'm happy to second the minutes. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, does anybody have any issues with the minutes? Okay, we shall consider those accurate and passed. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, due to varying the agenda, can we take the item on uh, the living wage next? Uh, I believe, Natasha, you said you were going to introduce this. Thank you, Chair. Yes, so this, uh, the purpose of this report is to update the Committee on Progress since the, uh, the, the, the recommendations of the last committee in September. The committee asked that officers establish a working group that has now been established with representatives from human resources, procurement, finance, legal and market research and they are actively working on uh, the, the, what was agreed at the last meeting. Um, so that was that officers write to all of the contracts that are relevant and in the scope of the real living wage. So the working group has met and a survey has now gone out to an appropriate uh, range of uh, contractors that the council deal with in scope for the real living wage. The closing date for that survey is the 4th of December um, and we are chasing up when necessary to make sure that we get a fuller response to the survey and communications from all of those contractors so that we can then do the relevant analysis on the financial impact of, of becoming an accredited employer with the uh, real living wage. Um, and that work is now underway um, and I also wanted to update the committee that we have also arranged a meeting with the Real Living Wage organisation. That meeting will take place on the 10th of December and will be attended by myself, um, Rochelle Neller, our Assistant Director of HR, um, um, Councillor Vernon Jackson, Councillor Pitt and the Cabinet Member for uh, Communities and Central Services, Councillor Chris Atwell, um, are with the aim of taking this work further um, and in preparation for a final report going to the committee in January. Um, at that point, I'll ask if there's anything that you want to add to that. No, I think that was um, a good summary. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yes, so just to let everybody know that a, a Chase email has been sent today to the suppliers to uh, remind them of the importance why we're doing it and a reminder of the deadline. And we're also asking them to give an indication of whether they're going to respond so we have an idea of what results we may get. Brilliant. Thank you, Natasha and Liz, for the uh, update. Um, I've seen that people have raised hands, and that's fine. I will come to uh, members in a moment. Um, as this item is for information only, um, I'm not anticipating a long debate, but I'm happy to do questions for clarification so that we all are on the same page and understand the process that's just been described to us. Uh, Councillor Corkery. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to all those that have brought the report today, uh, updating us on progress from previous meetings where, the issue's been, where this issue has been discussed. Um, a, a couple of questions, if I may. The, at the last meeting, one of the appendixes was um, a, an action plan, essentially, entitled Four Steps of Accreditation Beyond, um, and it was within that that the suggestion of an internal working group uh, was made. That identifies that action as being for clearly the relevant council departments, um, but also in addition for trade unions. Um, so I just wondered whether trade unions had been engaged as part of this working group, um, and if not, whether there's the opportunity to do so. Um, and secondly, this is part, part question, part comment. I think one of the things I found a little bit surprising about this issue is actually the lack of knowledge that we have about employment practices within outsourced services. Um, so, so clearly that's why we're doing um, this survey in order to identify the level of wages that are being paid. Um, and, but, but it strikes me that there's, there's further knowledge gaps um, with regards to other forms of terms and conditions. Now, I appreciate this survey has already been sent out, so presumably it's too late to change it, but maybe it's something the committee may wish to consider in future um, around improving our knowledge of, for example, pension entitlements, holiday pay, sick pay, 
all those other aspects of employment terms and conditions that are in addition to the basic wage that's paid. Thank you. So I, I can uh, respond yes, to that. Um, the unions haven't been engaged at this stage in terms of the working group, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an opportunity for that to happen going forward, really because the, the main aspect of the work currently is engaged uh, a bit more about all of the steps that we then need to take thereafter. We will certainly engage with the unions on all of this. In terms of the lack of knowledge of working practices um, amongst outsourced services, um, a lot of outsourced service providers will consider that information to be commercially confidential um, and won't always necessarily share that information with us. And depending on the construct of the contract, some of those will be open book, but many of them won't be, so we wouldn't necessarily have access to that information. We would always seek to understand it where we can, um, but that's not always going to be possible in every situation. Thank you for the clarification, Natasha. Uh, Councillor Sanders. Thanks, Ben. Um, what's the consequence or if some suppliers just don't reply by the deadline? What, what then happens? Is the accreditation, the accreditation process held up or do we just plow on without the information and what impact would the lack of replies have on our ability to become an accredited living wage employer? So the um, we're doing everything that we can to get as, as high a response rate as we can um, and I might ask either Sue, Sue or uh, Liz to talk about the thresholds that we've applied in terms of the response rate that we get from which to be able to draw um, as, as good a set of assumptions that we can in order to perform the financial analysis. So not getting any responses won't necessarily hold up progress, but it might be that we have to take more, make more assumptions than we would ideally want to take um, in understanding the financial impact. Okay. Thanks, both. Uh, Councillor Corkery. Thank you, Chair. Just a very brief um, follow-up in response to Natasha's response. Um, in future, would is it possible within procurement rules or legislation or, or whatever else for us to stipulate particular employment conditions? So, so for example, I mean, one of the big issues at the moment is clearly sick pay. Could the council take a position? Uh, within its procurement processes that we will only award contracts um, or commission services through third party organisations that pay full sick, sick pay as an example. I think I, think I might ask Liz to, to answer that one because that's um, not within my area of expertise. No, I mean in, in, in our procurements we, we can obviously request that they do so but we can't actually mandate that on suppliers, it's not in line with the, the procurement regulations. I think um, the question was also raised whether going forward obviously we can stipulate that suppliers have to pay the living wage and that's um, that's not something we, we are able to do. There's not a great deal of case law around at the moment for people who have done so. So I think going forward, it will have to take a risk-based approach um, in consultation with legal as well um, to look at doing so in our contracts. But re recent training that I've been on for social value has just confirmed that it's, it's not legal to do so under the procurement regulations. Thanks for that, Liz. Um, Rochelle, did you have some stuff to add into this? Um, only to come in and say with the employers that we've been engaging with other local authorities in relation to our learning around the real living wage and perhaps hurdles to overcome, this is exactly one of them that the employers are stating that actually even once you become accredited that it can be quite problematic around compliance and then future contracts because of the limitations enabled, enabling you to score against those criteria. So it's one of the potential problems that we're looking to work with other employers to learn how they perhaps overcome those um, who are already accredited so it is on our radar. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sanders? 
Thanks, Ben. So just to be clear, the problems we face in terms of stipulating all our contracts, all our contractors to pay the, li the, the real living wage is a legal one. It's got nothing to do with what we as a council might want to do. It's just running into the law and running into the regulations. Have I got that right? Stunned silence. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts from anyone? Yeah, that's basically right, Darren. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, right. Councillor Stubbs. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I can't resist myself just in making a quick comment. Um, and obviously, I haven't been at the previous meetings of this. I haven't seen and heard the discussions. But I did take the trouble this morning of reading the Council's quarterly monitoring report, um, and which is going to Cabinet, um, must be next Tuesday, I would think. Uh, and it's a sea of red ink. I've never seen so much red ink in a quarterly monitoring report. Um, massive proportion of the Council's reserves are going to be spent. Um, you can argue about the number, but there will certainly be less in the way of reserves you know, next year than there was at the start of this year. Um, and that is the background to all of this. So I think talk about, well, you know, let's increase the cost of services further when we don't have a balanced and sustainable budget now um, is, is, frankly, I think it's unrealistic. Thank you, Councillor Stubbs. Uh, and is there any other questions for clarification? I think this item is just for you know, accepting and listening to. Um, so I'll, I'd, I'm keen to move to the next item unless there are any further questions. Silence. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for officer inputs. If you have better places to be and are not needed for the future items, then we completely understand if you drop off at this point. Um, Next item up for uh, conversation is the sickness, sickness absence quarterly report. Um, who have we got uh, to introduce this? I'm assuming Rochelle it is. Wonderful. Thank you. Over to you, Rochelle. Thanks, Councillor. Um, so I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, the main message to take from the report is we continue to see a reduction in average days loss, reducing from the September report of 9.33 days per person to 9.22 days per person. The majority of services continue to see a decline in absence. There are a couple of key areas that we are proactively working with um, who have seen an, an increase, one of those being adult social care. And given the context of, and the environment that they're working in, it, it's not a particular surprise. So we have our wellbeing coordinator and the HR business and partner working with the senior management team there to proactively work with staff to understand more about the reasons for absence outside of the COVID obviously spectrum and see how we can support them. Um, but the main areas are around just general resilience at this late stage in the year and it, it, it being a very, very long year. The other area that we're, we're keeping a close watch on is uh, musculoskeletal in terms of reasons for absence levels because we have seen a slight trend in musculoskeletal um, absences increasing across the city council as a general rule. Again, not entirely surprising given the, the complete change in operating environments for, for many staff. So again, we're promoting the risk assessments um, at home and for those in the offices and we're also continuing to supply um, office equipment where needed in the form of chairs, um, monitors, footstools, all of those sorts of things to assist with the risk assessment. So key reminders there. In terms of wellbeing, um, the report outlines itself, but it, um, I'd be doing my service a disjustice if I didn't mention um, our wellbeing champion program was recognised by the LGA and um, our work in supporting adult social care at the beginning of the pandemic and deploying HR staff to each of our units has been recognised by the LGA in terms of supporting mental wellbeing. Um, so that's mentioned in the report. And um, the other one that we didn't bring to the last committee to highlight is the hidden disabilities work, so the sunflower scheme. Obviously, as a city council, we've signed up to that and shortly we'll be promoting both the training and the comms for the organisation as to how we move that forward. So those were the areas I wanted to draw your attention to. Brilliant. Thanks, Rochelle. I think an overall positive um, scene, given the overall context we sit in, um, but we'll hear from members. Uh, Councillor Stubbs. Um, yeah, just a, just a question, really, for my understanding of it. So, you know, in some ways, the two tables that we've got um, that don't tell the same story, because the story I, I would have expected to see is, um, you know, in social care, 
adults, certainly maybe children, um, that you would have you you would be sending people home with with almost with cold like symptoms, um, recognizing that they probably ha- you know if you've got cold like symptoms you probably got a cold. But we, go- we don't know that, so. I can understand if that's the situation why there's a high number of high level of absenteeism in adult social care. On the other hand, you have a table uh, about the reasons for absence um, doesn't show sort of any uptick really in absence for viruses or potential viruses because you know you, you know, again if you've got a cold, it's not actually a problem. It's just being defensive. So how do you reconcile that? I mean, the adult social care numbers are high. But is that actually down to people taking preventative measures who have you have you know um, cold and flu-like symptoms, or is it something else? Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, it will be a, a slight mix of both. I think it's probably impl- important to clarify that if people are self-isolating they're not recorded as sick if it's for a COVID-related reason, if they are so isolated because they come up on um, a test and trace or they they meet the COVID criteria for being symptomatic um, because the, the City Council made a commitment to record that separately and not against the absence level. So you wouldn't necessarily see a trend difference there um, because it's recorded separately. But in terms of what reasons we're finding for absence of the top reasons in the report it is the psychological the musculoskeletal but that's because we're finding people are working a lot more in those areas so where staff would have been on rotor and off rotor we're using the same staff over and over again so it's either the psychological or the musculoskeletal tend to be the top two reasons which is reflected in the report so that would be the the correlation thank you i wasn't aware about that accounting thing Thank you both. Uh, Councillor Corkery. Thank you, um, Rochelle, for the report and congratulations and please pass on all our thanks to the teams that have been involved in particularly in the Wellbeing Champion Programme, um, which as I say has been recognised by the LGA, which is um, kind of really talks to the benefits it has for staff. So thank you very much for that. Just a, a quick question, something that we've discussed before a number of times, the, the recording of work-related stress, um, which I know is now being recorded as a separate category. How long has that been in place? Do we now have a, a kind of um, full year's picture or is that still only part, part year? It's still only part year. So I think this is the third report from memory. I can double check that, but it's not, it's not a full year just yet. I'll, trouble, I'll double check the date, um, Councillor Corkery, and I'll come back to you. Okay, sure. Yeah, it's just because presumably, yeah, so years, so it's only once it's been in place for a year, we'll have a full picture we'll of what picture. the percentage is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Chairman, have we lost you momentarily? I think we have, David. So we have an absent Ben. Would members like to uh, adopt the vice chair whilst Ben rejoins us, or do you want to wait? Well, the vice chair is Donna, who is Luke. I think in these circumstances, in these in these circumstances, you need to propose and um, get a new chair. You need to propose a new chair. Luke, do you want to do it, or do you want me to do it? Why don't you do it? All right, I'm happy to do it until Benjamin returns. As having been chair of employment for how many years? Um, So. Um, uh, sorry, and I haven't got a list of who else wanted to say something on this. Um, is there anybody else wanting to chat on this, folks? No. Okay. Um, are we all right then with that, with the sickness report, to accept that from and thank everybody? I think it, it's right. We do thank uh, minute our thanks to um, the group who did get their um, to get their recognition from the LGA and 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 record our thanks to them. But I think it's also right that we record our thanks to everybody who's working so hard during the pandemic 
because I think people really are putting themselves out. Um, and it's not just in social social care, but across the whole of the council, people have been working really, really hard to look after the people of the city. And I think we should we should always record our thanks to that. Is that okay with colleagues? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, next thing then, um, reward and re recognition. Um, um, so, um, who's going to leap into that? Rochelle, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Tell us what we need to know, and are we all going to get medals? <laughs> um, I'll maybe add on another recommendation. Gongs for all. <laughs> Um, so this was a paper that we were asked to bring back following the last committee meeting in September um, with, with a view to reviewing our options. Um, at the last committee, we made a recommendation to hold um, some form of um, community award ceremony when it was safe to do so. And we were asked to keep that as a recommendation, and which we have done so, because we, we do think it's really important to build a culture of recognition both inside the organisation, but actually wider than that, more collaboratively. This response has been community-based, as the leader just mentioned. So we've maintained our recommendation there. We were also asked to table um, the existing mechanisms for reward within the organisation, and we have done so in one of the appendices. And it's probably quite important to note that, because um, I know there's always a lot of discussion around honorariums, honorariums have not been used to recognise contribution towards the COVID situation throughout the pandemic. And that's not because we don't feel that people have responded in the way that we had hoped and have gone above and beyond. It's just simply not an appropriate mechanism for individual officers to determine local remuneration for staff on such a corporate-wide event. So there have been no honorariums paid in relation to the COVID situation. At the last um, committee, we discussed other more tangible forms of reward. Um, and we didn't feel the timing was right last time to make a recommendation in relation to um, an, an additional day's annual leave. And that was related to, at the time the report was written, we hadn't collated what leave had been used over the, the summer period, essentially. We've now been in a position to review that with directors. And actually, after a, real, a huge push over the summer and through September and October, we do feel that it's now an appropriate mechanism that members could consider awarding an additional day leave, because we are quite confident that there won't be huge numbers of staff carrying over excess annual leave until the next leave year, with the exception of adult services who obviously find themselves in a, a difficult situation. If members were minded to agree an additional day's annual leave, we would make the recommendation that that is taken on the same day for the majority of staff who are able to take that, because what we find is then that limits the email traffic, the workload piling up. If everybody takes a day at different times, it can be very hard to catch up again. So our recommendation would be Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve, and in very much the same way that we've awarded sandwich days in, in the past as an, as an employer, um, as supported by members. So that's what we've included in the report as an addition, and over to members to discuss. Thanks, Michelle, and apologies, everyone. Um, my technology is not serving me well today. Uh, but I am back in the meeting and paying attention. Thank you to whomever took over from me. That, um, that's all right, Ben. I'm happy to do technology training for you if that is going to help. Thank you, Leader. That offer is highly appreciated as always. Um, members, any uh, questions or comments before we uh, get into further discussion? Um, Councillor Vernon Jackson. Well, I've got two. Um, Rochelle, my concern with this is... Because we have done sandwich days around Christmas and New Year, I'm not sure I understand. I don't think people will see this as any different to that. Um, so, are we? So we we have given people some time off, and I don't know what the proposal is this year. I haven't even looked at the date. We have given people some time off between Christmas and New Year in previous years. Is this going to feel any different or any better to that, Rochelle? Well, we're not. The way the calendar falls this year, we're not. We wouldn't be eligible. So it's normally where a, a, um, a day sandwiched in between a, a weekend and a bank holiday, yeah. so there would be one working day. And the calendar, as far as I'm aware, well, we've, we've triple checked, doesn't fall that way. So it wouldn't be a question that we would be okay. bringing the members. So it, you wouldn't essentially be getting both. So it may not yeah, be no, entirely no. Okay. different, but it's it it would maintain that position at a very um, yeah, after a very difficult year. Yeah. Okay, now that's fine. And can I, my second bit would be to say, uh, just so members are aware, 
um, I've written to the Chancellor of the Exchequer um, uh, ahead of his announcement tomorrow um, because I think to, it is it, it, it seems to me outrageous to suggest that people who have been working as hard as people have at the council here um, should be in line for a pay freeze um, as their recognition for all the work that they've put in. Um, uh, I'm, I just don't know how I would go down to the gun wharf unit at Harry Sotnick House in the isolation part there where people are working to get people out of hospital, make sure they're safe in an isolation unit before going back to their own care homes to break the cycle of infection from the pandemic and go to them and say, I'm very sorry, um, but the government doesn't think you're worth a pay rise this year. I, I, I think it's outrageous. Um, so uh, um, I think we need to do what we can. Um, but we need to be mindful that our, the money we have to spend is effectively all comes from government or um, the vast majority of it. But I do hope the government doesn't go down the route of uh, of of saying that over this year people work less than um, are worth less than, than in previous years where people have worked so incredibly hard Thank you Leader uh, uh, Councillor Stubbs Stubb. Sorry is it um, yeah, just, just to say really, just to sort of to go against that, I mean, do not forget that the, a tenth of the economy of this country is gone, and it's not all going to spring back. Um, there are there were figures out from earlier in the year which showed, in the, about the middle of the year, which showed private sector pay falling at a rate of about 3% a year, while public sector pay was growing by the same amount. I mean, you can't justify that gap. The, the lockdown has made this country significantly poorer and that effect will carry on for some years to come mm. that is the reality of it that is why and even though no one's really admitting it yet but it's true that people are going to be paid less than they otherwise would in both the private and the public sector benefits will be affected and taxes are going to be higher I and mean, then that's just the facts of it and i think it's a mm. pretty awful situation to be in but you know that and unemployment will be high but that's where we are i mean and there's you know there's no sort of denying that and, so, and we, we can't create a two-tier economy whereby it's massive reductions <coughs> of people in the private sector and protection <coughs> of the public sector. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stubbs. Uh, Councillor Corkery. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick question in terms of what other councillors are doing, other councils are doing um, with regards to recognising people um, and rewarding them that have worked over the course of this year. And so I understand some local authorities uh, within the area, I think Tess Valley is one that's been brought to my attention and perhaps Eastley as well, are going down the route of uh, a monetary uh, reward. Um, so, yeah, just a, a question of what I understand is what other councils are doing and how we're kind of benchmarking against that. Yeah, we, we've outlined that, Councillor, in Appendix 2, I believe, um, at the time of reporting those were the council. We've got Hertfordshire Council offering additional um, days annual leave on the 24th of December. There's a, there's a list there. Of, um, I won't read through them, but I've got some additional information back from South East employers. Um, specifically about our region, which we didn't have when we published the report. Um, so in addition to the ones that are listed in the report, um, we've got one district and two um, unitaries not discussing any additional reward at all. Three districts have made a monetary award, small bonuses to manual-based staff. Um, it should be noted one of those um, already has a performance-related pay structure in place, so that's, that's kind of the norm for them, so it's arguable whether they're doing anything additional to what they normally do and two districts and one unitary have offered one additional day's leave so we're we're confident we're in the in the range of what others are doing and um i know there was some suggestion from the trade from trade union colleagues that perhaps we could use the um job retention scheme payment that we should should have been receiving in january to kind of disperse across the organization um, but we won't be receiving that money now because obviously the scheme is it has been extended until march and having spoken initially to finance colleagues the expectation is that that money will go 
back to cover some of the costs because as an employer we decided to pay 100% of wages instead of the 80% which the government were allowed so there wouldn't be the finances to do that but yeah as a report um, a summary is in the in the back of the report as well as those comments there. Great thank you both. Uh, Councillor Sanders. Thanks Ben. Uh, Rochelle I think it'll be sensible to share the extra information you've got from South East employers with, with committee colleagues. Um, certainly that seems uh, consistent uh, with what I've been picking up. Um, I, w I would say that I think that having some sort of extra reward is useful because certainly if we're going to have a two-tier public sector workforce with NHS workers getting a pay rise but care workers not um, or teachers not, um, yeah. then I th or the police not, um, then I think that that is something that um, that we, we should be looking at some, as quickly as we can. Uh, but obviously we face a £12 million budget hole um, thanks to the virus uh, and so we have to go along prudently with whatever we can. Um, one question um, which is around the flexibility between Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. Um, given that the, the five days of relaxation, whatever that pans out to be, maybe between the 24th and the 28th of December or the 23rd and the 27th of December uh, but we won't know that until Thursday um, is there any way in which we could work with the workforce to try and make sure that that's maximised because I'm, I'm conscious that basically if it's 24th to 28th everybody is going to pile onto the motorways on the on Christmas Eve um, so it would be useful to know how whether that has any factor in your deliberations or not And if not, that's fine. It hadn't factored into our deliberations because we were unaware of it at the time of writing the report. But it's a uh, it's an absolutely valid point, and we can we can build that in when working with directors and in terms of comms as to how we how we package this. If indeed we are going to package this with staff. Okay. Uh, do, do any of the members have any questions or queries, and would anyone like to state any preferences um, in particular? Um, I know I've got thoughts, but uh, leader. I was going to go and suggest the recommendations on the paper. Uh, Chief Executive. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. I, ju I just wonder, at the moment, the um, the recommendation in terms of the additional day um, talks about two specific days. I just wonder, in the light of the fact that we don't yet know what the announcement is going to be about the Christmas to New Year period, whether if members do support that part of the recommendation, they'd be happy to leave the uh, the, the precise day open so that we can um, adjust to whatever announcements uh, we get over the next few days and select a day that would be more appropriate. Thank you David. Uh, Councillor Stubbs? Um, only really to say that yeah I will also um, support the recommendation albeit if it gets very slightly um, in light of the Chief Executive's comments. Wonderful. In which case, um, I'm happy to second the leader's proposal, which is essentially to uh, go with the recommendations, um, but with the caveats as um, the chief executive has outlined. Um, I'm I'm very happy with those. I think the two key things we're really talking about here are uh, some sort of award ceremony when it's appropriate, and the additional days annual leave, which is clearly good practice. Um, and a number of other authorities have chosen to take that route, and so. Uh, it would seem uh, logical that we have done the same. Um, I'd be certain, personally, I would be open to exploring an honoraria approach in the future uh, in a kind of retrospective way, um, particularly in adult social care. Um, but I appreciate we're not at that stage yet. Um, and I, I personally think that Stoke may have jumped forward sooner than they uh, needed to. Um, but then I'm not an expert on Stoke's financial situation, so maybe they have more money than us. Uh, David. I'm sorry, Chair, that was a legacy hand. I remember when there was no such thing as a legacy hand. Those were the days all of six months ago. Um, OK, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm not seeing any dissents, just lots of smiles. So we'll um, consider those approved unless there's any uh, any uh, problem with that.
Uh, and I believe that actually takes us to the end of our meeting, probably the uh, most cordial and quickest run employment committee we've had in some time. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And unless there's anything from anyone that I'm forgetting, uh, we'll end the meeting here. Thank you, Enjoy. Chairman. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.